Well, welcome back to the second of, we're not quite sure how many uh, sessions uh, responding to the questions that came from the presentation on September 23rd for AAII. And uh, I, I will encourage you, if you have not seen that presentation, uh, it's focused on uh, what is the best one, two, three, uh, and four fund portfolio. And uh, so I'm not going to review that session, but I do encourage you, if you didn't see it, to take a look. But we are going to address the questions that came out of that session. I don't think you have to see it to get the idea because these are questions that pop up every day. Now, I asked these other two gentlemen who are here with me, uh, those gentlemen, uh, at least on the bottom of my screen, is uh, Chris Pedersen. Chris, you want to raise a hand so that, yeah, there we go. Our Director of Research and Daryl Balls, our Director of Analytics. Uh, we, uh, I asked them and uh, also answered the question myself the last time we were together, whether they carried uh, any particular uh, accreditation, were they were, uh, could they be called a, a CPA? And we got no takers. Could you be a chartered financial analyst, CFA, no takers? Uh, we didn't even raise a hand when asked, are any of us uh, CFPs, uh, certified financial planners? And after we finished and we were discussing uh, the, pre the, the, the Q and A session that we went through, Chris said, what we are, we are CFFs. That's a conflict-free friend. <laughs> and I thought the other might be a CFA, conflict-free advisor. But wait a minute, we are not advisors. We are actually teachers. So maybe we're a conflict-free teacher. So welcome to another uh, session of teaching, we hope. Something will come out of this that will maybe make an impact on how you approach your portfolio. Now, what we did last week, we talked all about how Daryl put together the tables for us. And, and uh, um, if you haven't heard that, I hope you go back and, and watch or listen to that as well. Now, today we're going to take up, we were talking last time as we closed about equity asset class selection and, and, and how that is done. And that is a lot of the work that Chris has done for the organization. So Chris, I'm gonna aim a couple of questions here at you. The first one here is, why don't you include small and large growth in the analysis or in your recommendations? The reason we don't is that your portfolio is built on the work of Fama and French and the, the academic work that says that small and value deliver better returns over the long haul. And so if we included growth, small or large growth, uh, it, would, it would shift the portfolio away from small and value. Uh, so if you, if you think about what we're trying to do, we're trying to get a portfolio that has um, a little bit of growth in there just because we have blend, right? It's going to pick up some um, by having, for example, the S&P 500 or a total market um, fund in there that that's going to pick up some, some growth and, and a lot of large. Uh, but if that's all we had, we would have zero tilt towards small in value if it was the total market. The only way you get that tilt towards small in value is by having more of it in there. And so that's why there's a small value fund, why there's a value fund, a small fund. And so uh, it, it would just basically take the portfolio in the wrong direction. Um, it would take it back in the direction of being more like the total market. And uh, it would uh, reduce the chance to get those premiums that the portfolio was built around. And so the, the uh, outcome of that is going to be in markets that, that small and value are underperforming, it's going to look a lot different than the S&P 500. I mean, that, that's the part, as we know, 
from last week and, uh, and, and all of the questions we get about why is it value or why isn't all doing better? Um, that's the challenge is that it can look a lot different. Right. Yeah. It's, it's uh, a chance to have some regret when the, yes. when growth is doing really, really well, when you've invested this way, it's easy to feel like you're missing out. Um, that, but, but that is another reason for holding the total market or the S and P 500. They tend to have those high visibility winners, right? And if you hold the total market, uh, I, I, I like that because it gives you the ability to always say yes. When somebody says, you know, what about investing in ABC? It's like, I got some of that, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah so Google or Alpha. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's okay. just nice Here's, to know that you've got some of it. Yeah. Here's another one. How about gold and commodities? Why not? So uh, gold is, uh, gold's an interesting one. Uh, if you If you look at the history, it didn't trade like, most asset classes for most of the last century. It was fixed to currencies for a long time. But if you look at the recent history where it trades like an asset class, um, where, where you can trade it daily and, and it's, its price fluctuates, it's got the volatility of a stock, um, but the return of a bond kind of. It's, it's not a very productive asset. So we, we don't include it. People who do include it in portfolios usually include it primarily because it reduces, because it, it can reduce volatility at key points in history. Um, and so uh, it, it doesn't fit with the philosophy that the ultimate buy and hold portfolio was built around of maximizing your return per unit of risk. It doesn't have a great return and it's got a lot of risk. So, so that's why gold isn't in there. Commodities are, are largely the same story. It's a little bit different because they did fluctuate more during the, the last century. So there's more of a history there, but yeah, they, they're just, they're not that productive. Um, and I do model them and analyze them occasionally. I haven't yet figured out a, a way to incorporate them that I think would improve the return per unit of risk and fit with the rest of the philosophy of how we've built the portfolios. And from what I've seen, uh, when you look back at the, the real points of distress in the market, uh, your long-term U.S. Treasury bonds are much more productive on the short term in those distress situations. So when you look at the 50-year return of the Treasuries, they're higher than the 50-year return of, of gold. And as you mentioned, Chris, the volatility of gold is much, much higher. Um, now, we, we talked last time about internationals. We did not talk about emerging markets specifically, but um, just re revisit for a, a, a minute, if you will, Chris, uh, the addition of internationals or not. I, I, I'm not sure I understand which, which question are you? Well, are you the, the question about? of should we, a lot of these portfolios were showing people do not have internationals and what's the cost? What, what are you leaving on the table if you don't have internationals? I will just mention briefly that if I look at the last 50 years of a portfolio that we call the ultimate buy and hold portfolio, that's half international, half U.S., that the returns for an all equity portfolio are about, I think, two tenths better than the all US portfolio. So the increase in return is not significant, but you got some currency diversification. Take it from there, if you will, if I didn't just cover everything. I, I, I think it's, um, you know, it's relatively inexpensive diversification, right? You can, you can uh, very inexpensively buy the total world market right now in a, in a fund that's, uh, you know, very affordable, uh, under 10 basis points, probably per year. You can, you can buy international funds that are only slightly more expensive than the US. And what do you get for that? Do you get a higher return? Maybe. Nobody knows, right? Nobody really knows whether the U.S. is going to outperform international or the other way around. 
Um, a lot of people would say emerging markets have a better shot because they're small and they're coming up and you know that, that they've got a chance to outperform. But what you really get is you get um, insurance that if something absolutely horrible happens in your home country, um, and you know, we all pray and hope that it doesn't, but if it does, that you're protected against that. So it's very cheap insurance. And you know, there are many examples in the last century of entire markets that, that went away, uh, Russia, China, uh, Germany, maybe 90, 95%. I can't remember exactly what, but, you know, huge, huge crushing blows to economies that nobody would have anticipated or predicted five to 10 years ahead. And people who were diversified survived that. People who weren't diversified endured a, a life reset. Right. So I, I think that is the number one reason for diversifying internationally is just cheap insurance. I'm 50% international. Daryl, how much international do you have in the equity part of your portfolio? We're about 30%. Chris? We're, we're about 30%. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another one here. Um, are the various funds that are being recommended, and I, I, I'm going to say uh, certainly with ours, but also with the other portfolios at Boglehead or, or Rick Ferry or the Buffett recommendation, which was an index fund. Uh, are they all index funds? And Daryl, you could weigh in here. Uh, do you remember whether they are all index funds? I know that ours basically are is that true, Chris, in the case of the ETFs as well? Would you call them all index funds? I would. I would. Okay. Yeah. And Daryl, you got the same same answer? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I believe so. And, uh, and does it matter whether it's Vanguard or Fidelity? That's another question here. Uh, um, I, I, I think it's probably more important to invest in an asset class then after you've chosen to invest in an asset class where you do that investing, um, I would call it a second order effect. Um, it's more important that you have it than where you have it. Chris, what do you think about that? I would totally agree with that. Yeah, yeah it's um, a lot of times when I run the um, updates for the best in class ETF selection, I'll back test the old set and the new set and I'll compare it to Vanguard and to DFA. And over, you know, even a few years period of time, the differences are usually very small, very small, like on the order of less than a percent Kager uh, compound annual growth rate. It's... Um, it, what's far more important is which asset classes you're going to invest in than which fund you use it. Now, the, the one footnote to that is that I'm always looking at low cost funds. Yeah. If you invest in very low, you know, high cost, cost load funds, it's going to crush your returns, right? So don't do that. But w once you've gotten into some low cost funds, uh, I think, yeah, the differences tend to be minor. See, I, of course, am struggling with that question because now you have Fidelity with their zero cost funds. Uh, and uh, in, in looking just at recent history, it appears that that zero cost is picking up that difference in return compared to Vanguard. And uh, would we choose to be with a supplier who would give you one-tenth better expenses uh, five one hundredths of one percent. How important is it to us to try to catch that last one tenth of one percent? Maybe it has to do with the service you think you're going to get from one vendor or another. But is it worth the fight to pick up that last one tenth of one percent? Well, when I make my recommendations, I always try and get it. So I do my best. At it. <laughs> good. That's but good. yeah, it's how, how okay. much would I do it just for myself? I might actually try a little less hard. I work harder for the foundation than I do my own investments. Uh, I see. Okay. <laughs> okay. I also think that that if you if you decide to make that change for just a few basis points, that may be the situation now. But are you going to make that change again then? 
in five years when the person Absolutely just left right. yep. decides to change their business model and now they're cheaper. You know, yes. there's a little bit of... And that's part of what we only update there. the best in class recommendations every couple of years is I don't yeah. want to whipsaw investors. I don't want them trading every year um, unnecessarily. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, next question here uh, is... I think we've gone, oh, oh, I know one back here on this page, Chris. Somebody asked the question, do you guys use portfolio visualizer to understand the factor weighting of your portfolio? So maybe maybe not everybody knows what, port, what the uh, portfolio visualizer is. How about a quick rundown? I do, I do. It's a great tool. It's free um, and you can get it at, www.portfoliovisualizer.com. And it's pretty easy to use, especially if you're an interested student like I am. Um, but even when I first started, I, I started using their tools. I found them pretty easy to use. The question about uh, factors is uh, it, it uses something at the website called factor regression. So if you click on factor regression, you can type in any of the, the funds that are mutual funds, ETFs, the ones out of our best in class recommendations, our Vanguard recommendations, and it will tell you for as much history as it can, how much that fund's behavior was associated with a given factor, right? So for example, you take a small and value fund it's going to come back and it's going to say a lot of the funds results are due to just the market, right? There's a lot of market risk in a small and value fund. And then it's going to say there's, a, there's some exposure to the small factor and some exposure to the value factor. And that amount of exposure is going to tell you how much of the premium you get. So let's say that I'm just going to make up a couple of numbers. Let's say the small factor is worth 2% and the value factor is worth 2%. And the fund has a 0.3 exposure to each of those factors. Well, that means you should get a premium of 0.6% for small and 0.6% for value. And that would be about 1.2% total on top of the market, right? So you can use that tool then and say, okay, well, this fund costs a half a percent in expense ratio more than another fund. And that other fund, maybe it only has 0.1 exposure to each of those factors. Well, you can run the numbers and you can figure out whether it's worth it, right? It's, it basically helps you figure out, is this weak sauce or is this hot sauce, right? And, and uh, you might pay more for the hot sauce if you like spicy stuff, right? So that's, it's, it's a great tool. I love it. Yeah. And, 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 and Daryl, when we look at your, the, the, the latest uh, table going back to 1928 uh, and the showing the four funds and then each of those funds, large blend, large value, small blend, small value. And you show the annual results and how they rated against each other. Have you ever looked at how often one year at a time that you don't get the premium? I mean, it's, we, we, we know that you can go 10 years or 20 years and not get the premium that you, had, that you expected, but does it give you a better idea of how often you should be disappointed if you looked at each individual year and said, I don't like that, I don't like that, and I, I, I better be very patient if I'm going to try to pick up that, that extra return from those factors. Sure. If you look at that quilt, if the, I love the term performance quilt that one of the questioners used. Um, if you look at that, you can see how, how, how the, the battle for number one or number five, if you will, between the four asset classes and the four fund combo uh, plays out year after year after year after year. And it is, it's chaotic, not maybe not mathematically chaotic in terms of chaos theory, but it's pretty jumbled. Uh, let's see, should I show that chart again just for grins? Um, here's, here's the chart Paul is referring to, I think. And, you know, <laughs> here's a stretch where the small cap value was pretty good. Here's another stretch. 
here's a stretch where S and P 500 was good, you know, and here's, there's it's hard here's to see your hard to see your pointer, Daryl, just at okay. least I, maybe I'll move it slower. But, but if you look at the colors, you can sort of see how things bounce around. Yeah. And, uh, and sometimes from 1940 to 45, for example, the S and P 500 was the poorest performing class. Same thing from 64 to 68 six years in a row. Yeah. Yeah. Same thing from 2000 to 2006. So it can happen. On the other hand, there are other periods. There's a period here, for example, of, of five years where the S&P 500 was better than the four fund uh, portfolio. It was three out of five here, or three out of four out of five uh, for the whole period from 28 to 32. But if anybody, if anybody told you in 1928, as they told us in 1999, that the S&P 500 is very difficult to beat, and then they started to, in, in fact, in the earlier years of 28 through about uh, 33, it looks like, that uh, the S&P 500, you would have actually agreed with whoever told you. But then you find out over time, the S&P 500 is easy to beat almost, we could say, most of the time, uh, particularly because it's competing against all the other asset classes that it, it might be in the pool with. So uh, I, I just think that that table is a winner, Daryl, and, and uh, I, I look forward to sharing that with the Market Watch readers. I think they'll enjoy it. You know, you mentioned how in 1999, everybody was saying the S&P 500 is hard to beat. Well, if you go back and you look at the previous decade, it, it got beat eight out of 10 years. Yeah, yeah so you're right. I, I, and I remember the 90s that where you thought, boy, that's a hot, hot place to be. But it wasn't really. And then in the 2000s, of course, it really wasn't. So. And, and part of the problem is, it re not a problem, but the reality is the S&P 500 represents something like 80 or 85 percent of corporate America. And so we'd understand why it represents what most of us would have some sense about if we were interested in, in, in investing. Uh, what we didn't know for a very long time, in fact, until the, the 90s, uh, or, or the 80s were these other kinds of asset classes. We didn't have the history. No, the, the academics had not tracked all that history that we have today, which has created a different view of how investing maybe should be done. All right, well, I'm, I'm going to move on to another topic here, if you uh, are ready. Uh, comparing the returns. Um, We've already talked about how do returns change if you add international funds to the portfolio. Uh, but, but in the case of what we show in those 30 years, and we talked about this last time, so briefly, if we go back the previous 20 years to that 30 years, the interna internationals walloped the U.S., and what we don't know is how long it will be before that happens again. In fact, if we track what happened in Japan, it peaked out in 1990, I believe, and, uh, and is still way b below where we just lost Paul. Are you still there, Daryl? Uh, hey, Paul. I'm here. Dropped out. Where did you lose me? Am I back? Yeah. So I uh, start with uh, it peaked in the '90s. <laughs> so it, it Japan peaked in in the '90s, and uh, and and still today it is way below where it was at the peak back then. So whether we're talking about the U.S. market or the international markets. Strange things happen. And of course, that's the reason we believe in, in, in diversification. Uh, question for us, do you think Vanguard funds will do as well as DFA funds in building the four fund 
portfolio. And Chris, I've got to got to ask you because you put together those ETFs, and when we built that ETF strategy, the best in class ETFs, our goal was to try to emulate basically what DFA was doing in the way that they managed uh, their funds. So what do you think? Do you think that we can compete? Can, can, now, by the way, this was, will Vanguard funds do as well? But let me answer that, that before I pass the baton. The Vanguard funds probably won't because the Vanguard funds aren't built to be like DFA funds, DFA funds being smaller and a more deeply discounted value. Vanguard will do better than DFA in a market where large beats value and where uh, uh, beats small and where growth beats value. That's where Vanguard will look super. But DFA in those years that small and value are, are winning that race, they should look better than Vanguard. Now, over to you on your attempt to pick those that will do as well as DFA or better in terms of how they manage the asset classes. Well, it, as you point out, it depends on what regime we're going through, right? Whether large is in favor versus small and whether growth is in favor versus value and so on. And it, it's the thing about investing in these factors of small and value that is particularly hard is that the academics can tell you over the long haul, they have de delivered a premium. They can't tell you when they will deliver a premium. Mm -hmm. um, they can't even guarantee you that they will deliver a premium, right? So a lot of it uh, is, uh, it's, it's not entirely on faith, but it's because it, there is a lot of evidence. There's a lot of years there. But, uh, you know, you could, you could go a while before we find out. Um, I totally agree with you that we try to duplicate the DFA tilts towards small in value. Uh, and in fact, I think with the last go around on best in class, we did a pretty good job of coming up with a portfolio, a whole portfolio that compared very favorably with DFAs. Um, and we'll continue to try and do that. The other thing, though, that plays into this is expenses, right? So DFA customers have to pay a management fee. And in exchange for that management fee, they get coaching. For some investors, that's going to be a very high return, a very high ROI choice, right? If, if it keeps them from bailing at the wrong time, that management fee may be very, very well spent. For, for a customer who doesn't need that coaching, the expense that they would save even being in Vanguard with less of a tilt might well pay off, right? I mean, you're saving a lot in expense per year. So exactly which one's going to win and which one's going to win for which investor depends a lot on their behavior, the value that they would get from an advisor, um, and their ability to stick with whatever investment they chose, right? So for somebody who chooses Vanguard and sticks with it, they'll probably do great. I might add something about Vanguard and, and Fidelity. Uh, those ETFs that you've selected in the best in class list, they're all available uh, at uh, Fidelity and Vanguard without paying commissions. You still got to pay the spread, but uh, it, they're commission free uh, trades. And so in that regard, uh, Vanguard is a good competitor with DFA as long as they're using the best in class ETFs is what we would certainly like to believe. And uh, uh, I thank you for all the hard work you put into that. Um, I have read that the annualized return of the S&P 500 is 7%. It seems that the telltale chart does not show the S&P 500 in comparison. I'm gonna to try to, uh, to answer this and Daryl, if I don't get it, you weigh in. This 7% is basically what the S&P 500 is, has made after inflation. That's one. The other is, it is about the return of what the S&P 500 has made without the dividends. 
And, and so uh, those are two separate items. Remember when you see the return of the Vanguard S&P 500 fund, it is going to have a higher return than the index itself because it does include the dividends and the, and, and the, and the index does not. Uh, also, I have to throw another uh, controversy within our industry uh, about the S&P 500 return. There are people who claim that the S&P 500, that the return is 12%. Now, I would not want anybody to plan their uh, retirement savings on the S&P 500 making 12%. It's not a lie. It's a, it, 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 it's, it's a, it's improperly stated because here is where that comes from. If you average the return of the S&P 500 over the last 90 years, yes, it is about a 12% return, but you don't get the average return. You get the compounded return. And the thing that we need to remember is that if you put $100 to work and the first year it goes up 50%, and the second year it goes down 50%, the average return is zero. On the other hand, let's put that money to work. The $100 grows to $150 because it's up 50%. Then the decline of 50% takes it back down to 75% or $75. So that is not, that is not a, a break even. That is a loss of 25% or about compounded over 12% a year. So uh, the, the return of the S&P 500 can be used in a lot of different ways. And Daryl, would you add anything to that? Well, I would, I would uh, address the part of that question that referred to the telltale chart and that the, where was the, why wasn't the S&P 500 on the telltale chart? Well, the S&P 500 is on the telltale chart. It's actually the benchmark that the, the U.S. four fund in the, the particular case we showed is compared to. Mm -hmm. So that's when, when you build a, a, a telltale chart, there are two components. One is the benchmark or one is the fund you're interested in how it performed over time. The other one is the benchmark that you're measuring it against. In other words, the divisor. And so uh, the, the US four, the S&P 500 is in there. And so if you wanted to put the S&P 500 on a telltale chart, measuring it against the S&P 500 benchmark, it would be a line that would go straight across at one because the return was exactly the same as the benchmark. The fact that this, the US four fund goes up is because measured relative to the benchmark of the S&P 500, it outperformed over time. Okay, that's great, thank you. Uh, it, here's a question. It seems small cap value is driving the excess returns over the S&P 500. Uh, and uh, that excess value, I don't know if we made it clear or not, but at least over that period of time that Daryl went back to 1928, the S&P 500 compounded at 9.9% .9 large cap value at 11.1, small cap blend at 12, and uh, small cap value at 13.2, and by the way, long-term government bonds at 5.7. And so yes, if you have small cap value, by the way, and large value, and small blend, they are all going to drive that return but small cap value uh, has the combination of small uh, premium and value premium. So it has two things going for it that, that large value uh, does not. Uh, by the way, here's the problem for all of us. What does the future look like? Would it look like any of those numbers? Well, let me just give you the last 20 years because maybe the last 20 years will tell us about the future. I'm sure those are years that many of us have lived through and invested through. Okay, how did the S&P 500 do? 6.1%, 11.1%, 13.2%, 13.2%, 13.2%, 13.2%, 13.2%, 13.2%, 13.2%, 13.2%, 13.2%, 13.2%, 13.2%, 13.2%, 
large cap value, eight, small cap blend, 10, small cap value, 11.8, and the government bond, 7.5. If the last 20 years is indicative of anything, really, that would suggest that you're better off in long-term government bonds than the S&P 500, which is why 20 years simply is not enough. Anybody want to add anything to that tirade? No, I think okay. you covered it. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, here's a question. I think we touched on it yesterday, but Daryl, has, has there been any work to include dollar cost averaging uh, for people? You want to... Uh, uh, you want to just uh, touch on that briefly? Well, we yesterday we showed a table that had uh, an accumulate. It was called an accumulation table, where you put a thousand dollars a year in, adjusted for inflation over a fifty-year horizon. I think it was. It was, um, and uh, so that one will be referred to in the in the notes. So we should, we should have a link to that chart. Um, so yeah, work has been done on that. I know Chris has also done work on on uh, averaging an accumulation uh, phase of a, of a person's life or an investor's life. So yeah, you know, we, excuse me, Daryl. I'm sorry. Sure, go ahead. Uh, Chris, you uh, were going to have hopefully at your fingertips there, the access to some of these uh, pages of tables that people could, uh, could visit. Do you happen to have that page on the accumulation uh, accessible right there? Sure, Paul. Um, yeah, let me share that on the website. Let's show, let's show listeners how they can get there. Uh, so if we go to the website, uh, y'all seeing that now? Yes. Great. So up here under best advice, if you just scroll over that, it will pull down most of the resources that we're talking about. We were just talking about contribution tables. And so we, we can go in there and look at that. Um, just click on contribution tables. And you can see down here, uh, we've got the fixed cont contribution tables for the S&P 500, the 50-50 worldwide, 70-30 worldwide. We were just talking about the four fund combo, so I'll click on that. And there you go. You've got a, a series and you can see how different combinations of fixed income and equities would have played out from 1970 to 2019 with those contributions. Um, so it's a good, good way to check and see what that ride would have been like. Um, you, can, you can look at the other combinations as well. Uh, if you go back to best advice, it's easy to get to the distribution tables, uh, to uh, the uh, to fund for life, Every, everything's under here. So pretty easy this to get is... to, right, Paul? Yeah, this is really the meat of our work. These are the tables that for do-it-yourself investors who are trying to make important choices, how much in equity, how much in fixed income, and, and, and whether you want variable distributions or fixed distributions, you want to take out three, four, five, six percent. What are the implications over the long term? And kind of the base of all of that are the fine tuning tables because those fine tuning tables show the uh, annual returns that Daryl has used as, as the, uh, the information that he builds the rest of these tables with. So you can also see the, the risk and the annual returns. The whole thing is there in a sense to follow you through your life. The, the, the having the right choice of how much in equity is and how much in fixed income. Accumulation, putting that money away, you know, $1,000 a year, $83 a month, and, and adjusting it upwards for inflation, and then moving into retirement and deciding what kind of a strategy, how aggressive, how conservative, whether you do it as far as distributions aggressively or conservatively in terms of how much you take out or aggressive or conservatively, depending on how much risk you're going to take. So this is really, this is the culmination for me of a lifetime of work. And Daryl, bless him, really, it's amazing what he's done to give, the, give us this information so people can take it and put it to work in their lives. 
Unfortunately, and this is the weakness with this uh, trio here, we can't come sit with you at your kitchen table, and uh, which we'd, we'd love to do that, but, uh, but we don't have time. Anyway, thank you. I, I, hope, I hope people now will have a better sense of, of how to get there. You know, one of the questions that has come up in a number of ways uh, has to do with this uh, sequence of returns and the implications on uh, whether you're accumulating or you're taking distributions. And of course, this becomes really important when you're taking distributions. Uh, but a lot of questions about that, and it has a lot to do with which of these strategies would be really appropriate for somebody who is uh, in retirement and trying to live off of the money. And, and Darren, would you take a few minutes and, and uh, dig a little deeper with us into this uh, question about uh, understanding the sequence of returns and how, how impactful that can be on, uh, uh, on the investor? Sure. Um, we did have a question that asked about, you know, whether the, the four fund, isn't the four fund more risky than the S&P 500 from a sequence risk perspective? So I think we can answer that in a couple of different ways. Uh, one of them is kind of taking a qualitative look at things. And the other one is maybe a little more quantitative look. So let me see if I can share my screen here. And we'll look at some qualitative measures. You're seeing it there, guys? Yep. We'll look at some qualitative measures first here. This is the same quilt chart, which you may have seen earlier in, in the first podcast, I think. It basically has the four fund portfolio and the S&P 500 portfolio only showing. All the other asset classes have been removed, so it's easier to see the comparison. The blue boxes here are periods of time, years where the S&P outperformed the four fund portfolio. The red boxes are where the S&P underperformed the portfolio boxes, or under, under, underperformed the four fund uh, portfolio. So when you look at this chart, what do you see? I see a lot of red, okay? Often the, the S&P did perform, outperform, the four fund portfolio for stretches of many years. I should point out that these are stretches of more than a, a year or two or maybe three. So these are four or more years in a row where one portfolio outperformed the other. Um, and in the last 92 years, that only happened twice, the S&P 500. It underperformed five times uh, for four or more years, sometimes as long as seven years in a row. So from a qualitative perspective, the S&P 500 underperforms the four, pun, four fund portfolio more often than it outperforms the four fund portfolio for longer stretches of time. So this is kind of a qualitative look here. If we go ahead and look at a retirement, this is just strictly returns. If we look at a retirement withdrawal scenario where you start out with a certain amount of money, you start out 4%, let's say you take out 4% of your initial balance and adjusted for inflation for 30 years. So it's a standard retirement distribution scenario. So, and, and this is just 100% equity uh, portfolio, not realistic necessarily, but it'll give you an idea what the sequence risk between these two are. Uh, so how often do you run out of money? Four fund portfolio run out of money, runs out of money four times in the 63 scenarios. So these are scenarios that started in 1928 through 1990. We don't have, 1990 would be the last 30 year scenario. Four fund portfolio ran out once. Uh, of all of the other portfolios that didn't run out of money, how much did you have left at the end? Uh, in, the, in the worst case, the uh, S&P 500 had 600,000. You started out with a million, S&P 500 had 600,000. Four fund portfolio had 1.2 million, more than you started out with. So, so in, in nominal dollars. So the four fund portfolio, you end up with more money. What about the minimum sustainable withdrawal rate? Uh, so here, here, the S and P 500 had a minimum sustainable withdrawal rate of 3.77 percent. That's what it took to survive those four periods. Uh, where it ran out of money, you would have had to start out with a reduced withdrawal rate of 3.77%. Uh, 
uh, for the four fund portfolio to survive the one time it missed, you would have had to have a 3.35 uh, percent withdrawal rate. So those are the those are the ultimate minimums. Those are the rock bottom minimums. Okay. Um, on the other hand, if you're actually doing this in real life, when you look at it, you sort of see how things are going, and and you can get a feel for whether or not you may need to cut back a little bit. Uh, so if you're in a really disastrous scenario, you can do that. So to me, a more meaningful measure maybe is not the absolute minimum, but what's the 95th percentile? 95% uh, of the time, these withdrawal rates will get you through the 30-year period over the last 63 scenarios. In that case, the four fund portfolio allows you to take a 4.4% withdrawal rate. Um, and the S&P 500 is about 4%. Uh, 3.96. So the S&P, or I mean, sorry, the four fund would allow you to take out a little more. Um, the mean sustainable withdrawal rate over those 63, 30 year scenarios for the four fund is 9.4%. S&P 500 is 7.6, 7.7% in that range. So, and that's from that uh, perspective, from a sustainable withdrawal rates perspective, which is what keeps you from running out of money, um, the four fund portfolio looks like it might be a little better uh, as long as you pay attention to what you're doing. Uh, volatility is kind of an up and down thing. It doesn't really affect the survivability of your portfolio necessarily. It may affect how well you can stay with your portfolio. But, but so from, from the standpoint of which one has more sequence risk? Does the four fund have more sequence risk than the S&P? I don't think it does. And in fact, in some respects, I think it has less risk. Um, but to answer the questioner's question, does it have more risk? No, I don't believe so. Not when I look at this data. Uh, Carol, can you go fact, back to the less risk? Sorry, Paul, go ahead. Can you go back to the, 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 the table before the, uh, the quilt? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I think where this is confusing to people, I'm I'm guessing here, is that our intuition when when we hear that something is more risky, we think in terms of something not being as productive, uh, and not as dependable. But the reality is, and I've talked about this before. The way this table should look, or let's put it this way, the way this table would look at the end of the, uh, what, 90 years or, or so that are here, it, it should show the S&P 500 as the least profitable because it's the least risky. And the four fund strategy should be do better uh, in terms of total return, compound rate of return, because it's more risky. And so th this is doing, uh, this is simply highlighting that, that that higher risk of the four fund strategy uh, was in your, was to your advantage. Uh, and in particular, when we talk about the sequence of returns, when we look at that period of 2000 through uh, 2002 uh, or 2000 through 2009, boy, that's a killer period for people who retired in 2000 and were taking money out. And, 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 and so this is the way it should be. It's not like it's saying something bad about the S&P 500. It's simply saying that it is not as productive as these four funds together and therefore it's gonna last as long if the future like the past. And so uh, I don't know if, that, if, that's, if that's helpful, but that's how I look at it. And would you add anything to that, Daryl or Chris? Well, I, th I think what you what you say is is right in in some sense that the four fund is riskier than the s p 500 when you look at it from a return perspective but i think when you look at it from the perspective of sequence risk yeah. and you look at it in terms of of how often do you run out of money and what is your 
your sustainable withdrawal rate over a given period with a given uh, uh, portfolio. Mm -hmm. I think that from those two metrics, running out of money and sustainable withdrawal rate, I don't think it's any riskier. It's right. more volatile. And if you yep. measure risk by volatility, then it is riskier. Yep. But if you measure risk by surviving and being able to take out of your portfolio what you need, I think it's, it's not any riskier and it may be less risky. Part of the sure. reason why it's more volatile is because it includes some more volatile asset classes. Every, every asset class more, than, uh, more risky than the S&P 500 is probably going to be more volatile. And, it, and the forefront has three of those. So it's going to be more volatile. But when you put all those things, I think this is the benefit, one of the benefits of diversification. When you put all four of those things together and you look at it from a sequence risk over a retirement time span with, redult, with withdrawals, yeah. I don't think it's any riskier than the S&P 500. Yeah, if, if it was uh, me characterizing it, I'd say you're taking more risk in one way and you're taking less risk in another. So you're taking more risk in that you're investing in small and value asset classes, which have a history of having higher volatility in their returns. You're taking less risk though, because you've diversified across things that uh, don't do don't move at the same time. They're less correlated assets, right? So you you have one thing that's more risk, one thing that's less risk, and the goal of the ultimate buy and hold, as well as the four fund solution, in both cases, it's to uh, to get a higher return at close to the same unit, uh, same amount of risk, right? So you have these two things that I think offset one another and. So it's not surprising to me that the sequence of return risk is lower because I think you have a higher chance of better return, uh, you know, or a higher expected return, and you have that diversification that's reducing the likelihood that everything goes south all at once, right? Where with your the S and P five hundred, you're not nearly as diversified. You're invested in, in only one market, uh, one only one factor really, one factor premium, and that's the market. You're not invested in the small premium. You're not invested in, in the value premium. And so when the market is out of favor, you, you can spend a long time in the bottom and that's what this chart shows. Yeah, Chris, so, mentioned, Chris mentioned risk, risk r return for risk. And that gets back to the Sharp and Sortino ratios that we talked about on the other chart. Um, uh, earlier in the week. And uh, the four fund portfolio has a better sharp and Sortino ratio than the S&P 500. So you get, or at least it's about the same. And so you get the same or more bang for the buck than you do uh, with the S&P 500. Plus you do get a better return. So I'm 50-50 stocks and bonds. Better return. Uh, and uh, and in retirement and taking money out of, I don't have a pension, I have social security and taking money out of our investments. Um, is there anything about this relationship you see here that changes a lot if we looked at this kind uh, of an analysis uh, of a 50-50 strategy? Would we in expect there to be still this advantage uh, in terms of sequence uh, risk of risk uh, of return risk uh, will it still be an advantage having the four funds or the 10 funds versus the s p 500 I, i'm going to talk about examples that are like that uh, in my talk on the 21st and the answer is yes it, it should still help you out because this is basically the engine side of your portfolio, right? The other, the other half of your portfolio is not there to generate high returns. You, you know, you may have at times gotten a higher return out of the fixed income side, but not often, right? It's primarily there as uh, safety, security, uh, you know, you can call it brakes or safety belt, whatever you want. Mm -hmm. um, so it, everything that we just went through here is going to apply to the engine side of your portfolio and still help you out. Yeah. If you have bonds in your portfolio, the effects will be muted somewhat or reduced right. a little bit because the engine is, has a governor on it. If you want to think of that <laughs> yes. in terms of yeah. the bonds, but the effect is still there as long as the, the bonds that are in the two portfolios are the same and the allocation of those bonds are the same. The, 
effect should be the same, maybe just a little muted. And so if you add internationals, it could give a, a small bump uh, in terms of this, the, the, the risk of the sequence of returns. But it's not a very big bump. Is it, Daryl, from what you've seen? Uh, the Most of the analysis, this shows 92 years here. Most of the analysis we've done for the best portfolios, one, two, three, four portfolios, um, was only over the last 30 years. And that was a bad period for internationals. So, uh, so it did not perform well then. Uh, the I think I mean, having I think having international diversification in your portfolio is a good thing. Um, whether you should have 50 50 or 30 70 yeah. uh, is kind of individual choice. But I think to have zero uh, is you're giving up another source of diversification. What do you think, Chris? Well, I'm going to go back to 1970 in the analysis that I present uh, on the 21st, and it is consistent with what Paul just said. It's a small bump in volatility. Um, I, I think uh, it's within the uncertainty of the process, though. Uh, that That's the way I would describe it, because the differences across international uh, markets tend to move over long periods of time, right? These are historical changes. And so, uh, you know, what I show going back to 1970 would be very different than going back to 1928 or, you know, if we had the data going back to the 1800s. So I, I think there's just a huge amount of uncertainty in terms of what you can expect there. And the primary reason for investing internationally isn't that slightly higher return, lower return, slightly higher risk, slightly lower risk. It's to avoid the giant potential concentrated risk, right? Where something, God forbid, happens in your country, right? You really hope that you don't have to endure one of those historically awful periods of time. But if they happen and you're internationally diversified, that's, that's when it really uh, pays dividends and was worthwhile. And by the way, we did get uh, a number of questions about uh, the four fund versus the 10 fund and, and, and do, because I have advocated for the 10 fund strategy for decades, uh, am I still doing that? And yes, my own portfolio is still using the international, the emerging markets, the REITs, uh, the more the merrier as far as I'm concerned, but uh, I just have to protect against uh, the catastrophic. And, uh, uh, and so my view is gonna be a lot different than a 21 year old uh, in terms of concern for, uh, uh, for short term protection. Thank you, Daryl, I like that. Thank you both. Um, which strategies are better when you take tax implications of rebalancing into consideration? Um, first of all, I, 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 and we had other questions that had to do with asset class location. And I really have to recommend, rather than us spend uh, 20 minutes talking about that, is that this book, uh, Your Complete Guide to a Successful and Secure Retirement, written by Larry Swedrow and Kevin Grogan, uh, it has got a whole chapter on asset class location. Uh, I will share with you uh, ever so quickly, uh, kind of the bottom line, uh, and, and Larry, uh, from number one to number eight, what would be the things that you would want to have in your fixed, in your uh, tax deferred versus taxable? And so if I might just share those quickly, and it, it will answer a lot of the questions that we got, and that is the tax efficient investments that you would want in your taxable account would start with US core, that would be the S&P 500, and, uh, and international core. Uh, the next level, getting a little less efficient, emerging markets core, U.S. large value, 
and U.S. small value. Uh, I was actually I was surprised that the uh, small value was that uh, that high in the taxable uh, area. Uh, the next level of uh, going down, international large value. The next level going down again, international small value, then bonds, then REITs, then long short alternative style uh, uh, risk uh, strategies and commodities. And finally, uh, he lists reinsurance and the alternative uh, lending uh, uh, securities that a lot of people have in their portfolios. Uh, I, we don't get into the alternative uh, strategies in the work that we do. Uh, I don't think they're appropriate for do-it-yourselfers, particularly a young do-it-yourselfers. Now, this is a relatively long chapter, so there's a lot of meat in this book. And for the few bucks it's going to cost you, I will just tell you right now, and as I said on a, uh, on a, um, a Choose FI uh, Facebook presentation, I actually bought a hundred of these books to give uh, to friends. I know you guys are shocked I have a hundred friends, aren't you? Uh, actually, I'm shocked you haven't given me a book. Oh, yeah, <laughs> well, I would have had to pay to ship it to you, Chris. You know me. Mr. Now Chief. we know who the real friends are. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I knew I was going to step on that one. Well, anyway, I really encourage you because he has a wonderful chapter in here. This is another question that came up. It's not a page. It's about four or five pages about using dividend producing stocks as a way to build a portfolio. Uh, you may not agree with him, but you can certainly, when you read his work, you'll know he's looked at it, at it uh, carefully. So um, you have anything you wanna add? I gotta pick up my papers I just dropped here. I, I think that was great. We're almost out of time for this one, I think. Oh, you're right. We, this, uh, yes. I'm. You know what? Are we going to be able to get the rest of this in one more? I, we're going to have to, I think. I, I think we will have uh, have done it with one more of these. But uh, I want to thank everybody for for listening and, and for those who, who watched. Um, we really enjoy doing these uh, as, as a group. And uh, uh, we certainly like feedback on how difficult it is from uh, those of you who are listening to the podcast and not seeing, for example, Daryl's uh, tables and whatnot. Uh, let us know and we'll continue to, to kind of figure out uh, how to make those work better. We will have a link uh, to the, the, the charts and tables that Daryl uh, produced and, and that Chris shared. So um, we will see you next week. All the best. Thank you guys.